Good morning to you all. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it seems rather strange to be following Professor Coffey, who's talking about the future, because I'm taking you back to the past this morning. So it's the eve of the Second World War, and we're in Bordeaux. Thank you. And it's a, it's a meeting of a learned society of neurologists, and one of their numbers stands up and approaches the podium just as I have and is about to uh, address his audience. Now, I imagine there are very few people in the room that will ever have heard his name, uh, but what he's about to say has uh, enormous import for our conference today and indeed for work that the society is going to be involved in over the next five years. And my hope this morning is to tell you a, bit, a little bit about who he was, what he said, and how it's going to influence the work of the society. So the, the man uh, is called George de Morsier, or sometimes George Morsier, although he refers to himself with the dirt in it. He was a, a Swiss neurologist from Geneva. At the time, he was in his mid-40s. Uh, he had uh, just taken over directorship of the Department of Neurology in the University of Geneva. And he had an interest in hallucinations, in particular, visual hallucinations. So that's seeing things that are not actually there. Now, I know that there are many of you in the audience that have had this experience and will, will recognize uh, what I'm about to tell you. But the hallucinations range from simple phenomena. So it may be uh, seeing a spark of light, a Catherine wheel, a flash, for example. Uh, to more complex forms. So it could be a, a pattern, uh, brickwork, for example, or lattice work, and then through to specific objects. So perhaps a, a face looming up in the darkness in front of you, often distorted uh, with the description given of being like a gargoyle, uh, perhaps with prominent eyes and, and prominent teeth. It could be a figure, uh, often a, a small figure, Lilliputian, a person or, or, or child uh, wearing a costume. It could be a knight in shining armor, Napoleonic uniform, Victorian dress, for example, and often with some form of elaborate headgear, a hat or, or a helmet. Uh, it could be text, small words uh, or letter strings that when you look closely, you realize you can't actually read what it says. Or indeed, it might be musical notes, crotchets and quavers and staves, uh, sharp signs, uh, and for those of you that are musical, uh, when you look at them carefully, you realize again that the music doesn't itself make sense. And finally, landscapes. So it may be an English country garden, it may be a, a rolling vista of mountainsides. So de Morsier was interested in all of these phenomena, but in particular, the clinical conditions in which they occurred. And in his talk, he presented a catalogue of them, a list of all these different conditions. They included, for example, stroke. So small strokes of the visual pathways were associated with these types of visual hallucinations. Uh, they included intoxications, so medication or alcohol. And in particularly in France in the previous century, it had been absinthe that had caused lots of visual hallucinations. Uh, it could have been dementias, and uh, de Morsier referred to Alzheimer's disease, the same disease that we recognize today, as a possible cause of visual hallucinations. But all of this was known to his audience. These were well-recognized causes of visual hallucinations, and what de Morsier was excited about was that he had stumbled across a new cause. In his clinic in Geneva, he had come across a number of elderly people who uh, had visual impairment, but otherwise had none of the other types of uh, disorders that I've mentioned. They had, didn't have strokes, they didn't have intoxications, they didn't have dementia. And yet they had prominent visual hallucinations. And he announced at this meeting that henceforth, this condition was to be called the Charles Bonnet Syndrome. Now, I want to just uh, step back a little bit and, and ask why he chose that name. Why did he call it the Charles Bonnet Syndrome? Charles Bonnet had been an 18th century natural philosopher. So he'd been something of a childhood prodigy. He'd uh, had an interest in insects and botany. 
but in his uh, 30s, he developed a problem that, that meant he could no longer use a microscope. So he turned to philosophy and, and psychology. And in 1760, he writes uh, a long treatise, The Analytical Essay on the Faculties of the Soul. And if uh, you, you refer back to it today, you'd probably rename it as the faculties of, of the mind, because he's really talking about the relationship between the brain and the mind. And within that, he describes uh, an elderly man who we later find out was his grandfather. And this elderly man had visual impairment. Now, we don't know what the cause was. He'd had cataract operations that had been successful initially, um, and he'd probably developed age-related macular degeneration, although we'll never know. But this man, Bonnet, is, takes pains to point out, was otherwise entirely normal. So in Bonnet's words, he was full of uh, health, memory, and judgment, and started to have uh, visual hallucinations. And these ranged from, uh, again, simple patterns. Uh, Bonnet describes how he saw brickwork with the intricate detail of the mortar around each brick. He saw figures. In, uh, in, in 1760, of course, it would have been contemporary costume, these flowing uh, silk dresses. Uh, but the ladies he saw had inverted tables on their heads. Uh, he saw his walls uh, adorned with pictures, beautiful landscape pictures in golden frames. Out of his window, he would see a carriage uh, growing to monstrous proportions. Now, um, de Maussier recognized in this story exactly what he'd seen in his clinic. So he uh, wanted to celebrate Charles Bonnet's description by calling his new condition the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And you might ask further, how did de Maussier know about the Charles Bonnet syndrome? And there's a happy coincidence. De Maussier's uncle uh, was a psychologist and uh, had been the editor of a psychology journal. And when de Maussier was a teenager, the, the inaugural issue of this journal had presented the Charles Bonnet story in full. So naturally, when uh, de Maussier came across a similar story in his clinic, uh, he immediately recognized it and hence was able to name uh, the condition the Charles Bonnet syndrome. So we use the term today in exactly the same way. Uh, we refer to uh, people who lose vision and then develop visual hallucinations as having the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And the typical story is that someone will lose their, the, have a, has a significant deterioration in their vision, and within a few weeks or months, perhaps, uh, they'll start to have hallucinations. And the hallucinations start off very florid and, and severe, so they may be very intense, happening all the time, and gradually they improve, so that the figure we quote is that by 18 months or so, many people's hallucinations have got better and resolved. That certainly isn't the case for everyone, and there are many people who hallucinate uh, for, for far longer periods, if not uh, continuously after that. We know that not everyone gets it. Only about 15% to 20% of people with visual loss will have it. So it's only a certain uh, number of people that will have the Charles Bonnet syndrome. So de Maussier gives us the Charles Bonnet syndrome in Bordeaux about 75 years ago now. And in the intervening time, we've learned a little bit more about it. We understand uh, that it's the normal response of the brain to visual loss. Uh, we understand a little bit about how different bits of the brain cause different uh, hallucinations. But if truth be told, it remains very much the case that not everyone has heard of Charles Bonnet syndrome. And I know that there'll be people in the audience here who, when they first had visual hallucinations, had never heard of it and would have been frightened what it meant for them, whether it meant that they were developing some other more serious uh, mental illness, for example. And perhaps most significantly, when they went to their doctors, their doctors weren't really aware of it or weren't able to give them a very good account of it. And here steps in uh, the Macular Disease Society. Because this year, the annual survey, and I'm very pleased as it's the 25th year that you've chosen this topic, um, your annual survey this year will be to explore 
uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome within the society. So a questionnaire is going to be sent out in, in the coming weeks to a selection of members. And the aim will be to find out, first of all, what percentage of the membership have Charles Bonnet syndrome. But far more significantly, perhaps, is to find out uh, when you first had hallucinations, uh, what you knew about it, and also what the healthcare professionals that you spoke to about it knew. And in this way, we hope to understand uh, how best to educate uh, the public and uh, healthcare professionals in general about the syndrome to raise awareness of the problem. Now, I'd like to return to Bordeaux and uh, de Morsier's talk and consider uh, another highly significant contribution he made at that time. De Morsier uh, was very keen to distinguish between Charles Bonnet syndrome and other causes of visual hallucinations, in particular Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Now, Parkinson's disease is a disease of the motor system of which a percentage of people do have visual hallucinations. Alzheimer's disease is primarily, primarily a disease of memory but also of planning and, and uh, uh, judgment and also um, uh, concentration, for example. And patients with Alzheimer's disease do get visual hallucinations. But neither Parkinson's disease nor Alzheimer's disease has prominent visual impairment. So the question arises, uh, can we learn something about Charles Bonnet syndrome by studying uh, people with visual hallucinations and Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, or vice versa. Can we learn something about uh, the visual hallucinations of Charles Bonnet syndrome by studying people with Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and visual hallucinations? Now, about four years ago now, the Society generously funded us to do a study on treatment for uh, visual hallucinations in Charles Bonnet syndrome. It was a proof of concept study, it was a brain imaging study. I recognize some members in the audience today who took part in that study. And the idea was to find out uh, what the best likely treatments would be for uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome hallucinations. And we found that a particular type of eye movement seemed to be uh, a good way forward. It, it, it was a, an exercise that people could do that would stop a hallucination in its tracks. It wasn't a cure for all the hallucinations uh, in the future, but it could stop one as it was occurring. And that stood alongside other treatments that we knew about, such as changing ambient lighting conditions, or if you are sitting in a, in a state of quiet rest, getting up and alerting yourself. Um, so it was, it was an, a set of uh, different treatments that we knew helped most people, at least. And uh, we wondered whether such treatments might also be useful for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And, and conversely, where the treatments that we know work for visual hallucinations in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease might have some help or something to say for people with Charles Bonnet syndrome. So we approached the Department of Health to seek further funding on this. And I'm delighted to say that we were successful in, in our uh, approach. And we have been just awarded two million pounds two million pounds, I repeat it again, not as big as Professor Coffey's number, but big <laughs> enough. Um, so two million pounds to explore exactly this issue, uh, the uh, visual hallucinations in Charles Bonnet syndrome, in Parkinson's disease, and in Alzheimer's disease. So we're hoping to find out what happens to the hallucinations in these different groups, the experiences and needs of patients in each of these groups, the economic burden to the NHS as a whole of visual hallucinations, and of course, new treatments, treatments that apply either to all of these different groups or all the groups individually. So that by 2017, we hope to have radically changed the landscape of hallucinations across the UK and, and uh, within the NHS. So we don't know what that's going to look like yet, but I imagine uh, there'll be new services, for example, uh, involving lots of different disciplines targeting visual hallucinations specifically. I imagine there'll be uh, new treatments, uh, where, and, and uh, whether that's specific medications or strategies that are of use uh, for each of these different groups. And at the very least, we'll have sets of guidelines uh, that are based on 
evidence now rather than just anecdote, guidelines for patients themselves, for, if appropriate for carers, uh, and perhaps most importantly for healthcare professionals that will outline exactly the types of, of treatment that work and, and the sorts of things that we should be doing and investigating for anyone that presents with visual hallucinations, whatever their condition. So I'm going to end by, first of all, thanking de Maussier for giving us the Charles Bonnet syndrome and for pointing out the specific differences between uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome, and Parkinson's disease. I'd like to thank the Society for its support of visual hallucination research and also advocating and, and um, advancing the cause. Um, and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>